verse where we read this morning in Exodus 17, Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Nisi. This morning we look at the next compound name of God, the word Jehovah, as we know as self-existing one. And the word Nisi means a banner, a pole, an ensign, or a standard, particularly a rallying point. A rallying point is a point in which people join together for a purpose or a cause or an end. Moses builds an altar not of sacrifice but of remembrance, which was often done in the Old Testament to remember in this context and in this occasion Jehovah Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner. And that's the title of this message this morning. The Lord is my banner. Is He yours this morning? So, three things we look at this morning. First, Israel's enemy. Jehovah Nisi was revealed in the context of an enemy. Number two, Jehovah, or Israel's banner. Jehovah Nisi was given in the context of Moses lifting his hands up. And when he did, Israel prevailed. And when he let his hands down, Amalek prevailed. The altar was named Jehovah Nisi in that context. What does that mean? What is the banner that symbolizes the name, the Lord is my banner? And then third, Israel's triumph, Israel's victory and yours. How do we apply what we learn in this context about Israel to us today as a church? Not everything that happens here is applicable to us, but we know from Romans 15.4, whatsoever things were written aforetime, such as here, were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of Scripture might have hope. Scripture, learning Scripture produces patience and comfort because Scripture produces hope. If you don't have any hope this morning, you're not learning Scripture according to the Bible. What is it that we find hope? What do we find? Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Ghost. We learn from Scripture, we endure, we're comforted, and we have hope, and hope produces joy and peace when we believe what we read about Jehovah Nisi. So there's something for us to learn. There's a lesson for us, although everything about we learn with Israel and the context is not meant for us literally in every respect. So let's look at this, beginning first with verse 9, or 8 rather, Israel's enemy. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Who is Amalek? Well, the word literally means dwellers of the valley, and that's exactly what they were. They dwelt in a southern valley of Canaan. This is why Israel meets this tribe or nation first. But more importantly, Amalek is the son of Eliphaz, according to Genesis 36.12. His mother was Eliphaz's concubine named Timnah. What's so significant about that? Because Eliphaz is the son of Esau which means Amalek is a direct descendant of Isaac, which means Jacob and Esau being brothers, Jacob's 12 sons and Esau's son's sons, Amalek, were cousins. Now you would expect when you meet a cousin and one set of cousins has been in bondage, cruel bondage for 400 years, the other cousin may say, hi cousin, what can I do for you? How can I help you? It must have been hard in all that bondage. But rather, Amalek is going to fight with Israel. Amalek is the enemy of Israel. Now, if you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17, we learn something about the way that Amalek fought Israel. They were cruel. They were underhanded. And they used guerrilla-type warfare against Israel. Deuteronomy 25, verse 17 says this, 
Right before they're going into the promised land, Moses says to Israel, Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when you were come out of Egypt. That's what we're reading about in Exodus 17. How he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou was faint and weary, and he feared not God. Amalek encounters or unexpectedly comes upon Israel, not in traditional ways of warfare where they set the battle in array, one army against another. They smote the hindmost part. They would attack and retreat. They would use guerrilla-type non-traditional warfare. But not only that, that they smote the hindmost part, they smote the feeble which means the weak, literally means to be shattered, unsteady. The elderly, maybe the women and children. Whoever was in the hindermost part, probably because the more eager part of the group was ahead, or maybe leading, maybe to protect in the front, they came from behind and smote the feeble, the shattered, the broken, the unsteady, the weak, the ill among them. But not only that, Amalek also smote them when they were faint and weary, faint and weary, exhausted. Now remember, Israel is on foot. They're walking to the promised land. This is not necessarily smooth terrain. They're in the wilderness of sin. And Amalek comes from behind, smites the feeble, and attacks them when they're weary and exhausted from the tail side. The word hindmost means tail. But look at the root issue here. They feared not God. Amalek then represents the enemy of God's people. He represents the depravity of man. He represents the carnal mind. Because we read in Romans 3.18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Paul there in Romans 3, as you know, is describing that the Jew and the Gentiles are all under sin. And as he gives this dark description of man's depravity... His corruption before God. At at the bottom, at, at, at the very root, he says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Amalek has no fear of God. Romans 8, 7 says, the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It, it, it can't be. It's not possible for the carnal mind to be subject to God. It's enmity. It is hostile toward God. Amalek, they do not fear God. They represent the enemy of all righteousness. They represent the depravity of man. They represent the carnal mind, which is hostile and an enemy of God. Now, because they didn't fear God, think about how they were attacking, in a way, God himself. First, they attacked God's redemptive people. They had just come out of Egyptian bondage. Through the spectacular wonders of God's plagues and power as He parted the Red Sea. Exodus 9.16 tells us, Even indeed for this very cause have I raised thee up, Pharaoh and the Egyptians, that my power might be known and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. The name and the power of God after the exodus, was declared, it spread throughout all the known world at that time. The Jerichoites heard about it, the Canaanites heard about it, and you can rest assured that southern tribe called the Amalekites, they knew, they heard about what God did to the Egyptians, but they didn't fear God. They attacked God's redemptive people. They attacked God's redemptive plan. It was God's plan to bring the Israelites to Horeb, to deliver the statutes and ordinances and then bring them into the promised land. Now Amalek is is cutting them off. Amalek is attacking God's redemptive plan. And then thirdly, Amalek is attacking God's redemptive purpose. God's purpose was to bring this nation into Israel or into Palestine, the land of Canaan, as he covenanted with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that they would be a people under God, that after He delivered the statutes and ordinance, they would live to show forth the praises of God out of Jerusalem, out of Israel, out of that part 
of the world called Canaan. At every front, because Amalek did not fear God, they attacked the throne of God itself. In fact, some translations in the last verse of our chapter, where it says the Lord hath sworn, it says His hand was against the throne of God. And when you look at the Hebrew language, that is a, a potential way to translate the passage. But either way, it stands the same, doesn't it? The Lord hath sworn, why? In verse 19 of Deuteronomy 25, Therefore it shall be, when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about, in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. Amalek attacks, raises its hostility against the very purpose, the people, and the plan of God, against the throne of God itself. Now, beloved, in this we see Amalek as a type of our enemy today, don't we? We know behind Amalek is the arch enemy, that old serpent from Genesis chapter 3. When God tells the serpent in verse 15 of that chapter, He says to the serpent, I will put enmity or hostility between thee and the woman, between your seed and her seed. The seed of the woman shall bruise or crush your head. Your seed will bruise his heel. Now, we know that ultimately to be the Lord Jesus Christ. But how did He come? Through the descendants of the woman. Jesus came through Israel. And every point along the way, that serpent is attacking. Through the Amalekites, through the world, He's attacking the seed because He does not want His head crushed. The devil attacks the people of God, the purpose of God, and the plan of God in redemption. Now, how is it that Amalek is the seed of the serpent? Well, a seed there can be an offspring or descendant. A descendant can be a physical offspring, like children's children's children. But a descendant can also be a person who follows closely or adheres to the teachings, the methods, or the practices of an earlier master. In what way is Amalek the seed, the descendant of the serpent? They are following closely the practice and the methods of the serpent himself and trying to destroy the seed, which is Israel, for which Amalek is seeking to do. And this is where we draw our first lesson under Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner, given in this context. The Lord is our banner, beloved, which means we must be aware we're in a war. Now, our war is not like Israel's. Nevertheless, we must be sober, Peter says. We must be vigilant because your adversary, your enemy, the devil, like a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. To be sober is to be self-controlled. To watch is to be vigilant, Peter says. Why? Because you have an enemy. An enemy that's behind Amalek. The enemy that's behind the world, the enemy that is alive and well today, the enemy that wants to devour the church, just like Amalek wanted to devour Israel. So in coming under the banner of Jehovah Nisi in our mindset, our awareness that we're at war, we come under the mighty hand of God, Peter says. Who is it that the devil, like Amalek, would pick off from the rear, or that person or church that's wandering behind, or that's moved away from the herd or the flock. It would be the proud, Peter says. God is resisting the proud, but giving grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, because He cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, your adversary is trying to pick you off. And who is he most successful with? The proud. Not the weak, not the humble, because the humble are actually strong under the banner of Jehovah Nisi. The proud are actually the weak, because they think they're strong. And what do the pri proud do? They don't stay under the mighty hand of God. They live life on their own terms. 
They won't submit to the authority of God's word or to God's providence. And so the devil, the adversary, is like a roaring lion. He wants to pick, pick off the weak, the feeble, the faint, the exhausted. Not physically, but spiritually. Those who are not under the word of God. Those that are not in the word of God. Those who are not bringing their life under the banner of the word of God. To be self-controlled and to be watchful means I'm aware there's an enemy. I'm aware of his devices. I'm aware, like Amalek, he wants to destroy me. And so being awake, be sober, is half the battle, isn't it? You see, secondly, as a church, we've got to be sober, we've got to be vigilant. Things are changing rapidly in our culture and in this world. And we've lived so long in a time period of religious freedom and prosperity that we've grown weary or sluggish or sleepy. I like to call it a movie theater mindset in church. That's the way we approach church sometimes today, with a movie theater mindset. Now, in the few times that I've been to a movie theater in the last few years, when you find one that's worth watching, boy, it's different than the seats I used to sit in as a boy. Now, when I was young, the chairs were so close together, your only concern was, am I going to have to eat my popcorn like this, or can I get my elbows on the rest real quick? Today, there's recliners. You push a button and you lay back. My greatest challenge at 57 in a movie theater like that is not to go to sleep. It is comfortable. It's nice. You can spread your legs. You can put your hands behind your head. You can roll over. If you want to talk to the person beside you, you have to lean over just to get their ear. And see, that's what we do in church sometimes. We come in and we say, sit down, relax, let back your seat, and enjoy the show. Beloved, we're in a war, and we're not here for entertainment. We're here to get the marching orders of Captain Jesus, who's the God of our salvation. And if you don't know we're in a war, then you're more vulnerable to your adversary swallowing you up like a lion swallows a weak animal. We're at war. And so part of the battle for Israel is to recognize these people aren't friendly. Amalek is trying to destroy us. Amalek is an enemy, and they represent the depravity of man. They represent the carnality and the enmity of the mind towards God. And they represent what's behind that enmity is the serpent himself, the old dragon who seeks to make war against the seed of the woman or the remnant of the seed of the woman who keep the commandments of God. That's who he's after and that's who the world is after today. So there's Israel's enemy, Amalek. And the lesson for us is, although Amalek is not our enemy, yet the devil and the world are. Do you know this? Are you aware? Do you live life in light of the fact that there is a being, there are principalities and powers that are trying to destroy my faith? Well, God put it in His Word to make you aware, to be sober, and to be vigilant, which means watchful. Number two, Israel's banner. Well, after Amalek started fighting and picking off people from behind, this is what Moses said for Joshua to do in chapter 17 and verse 9. Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were weary or heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him and sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, and ultimately Joshua discomfited Amalek. Now, what is happening? Why is it that when Moses raises his hand, things are going well? And when he lowers his hands, things are not going so well. And how does this relate then to the Lord is our banner? Well, man, you probably know something about this. If you've ever had to hold up a picture in your house that potentially is going to be hung on the wall, at first it's not that heavy. 
But as your wife starts to look the scene over and contemplate what she wants to put beside it, over it, under it, Peggy's not here today and I'm kind of glad, all of a sudden your hands start getting tired and then you lower your hands. And then you call for one of the children to come over and hold the other side and then you can hold it up. Well, that's what her and Aaron see that's happening. They observe that when Moses' hands are high, Israel prevails. When it's lowered, Amalek prevails. So they put him on a boulder and they hold up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other, and he's steady to the going down of the sun. Now, many commentators will point to the fact that this symbolizes the Lord our banner in intercessory prayer. But I struggle with that a little bit. Because I don't see prayer in the passage. That's one of the difficulties of preaching through the Old Testament narrative is that you don't put something in the text that's not there and start spiritualizing. And that is a struggle. Because it makes a nice, neat sermon when you can draw things out that are not there. And that's not to criticize. That's one of my own struggles. But what do we take then about Moses as a type of Christ? Does that mean when he lowers his hands as a type of Christ, Christ is getting weary with interceding? That wouldn't work, would it? He ever lives to make intercession for you, and He makes intercession constantly at the right hand of God. And so, Jesus does not get weary of interceding, and if Moses is a type of Christ, then that would seem to suggest that He's always interceding and not growing heavy. But I think, as others would suggest, the banner is the rod of God in His hand. Right Now, a banner or rallying point is to be a conspicuous pole. It wasn't a flag like it is in our day. It was a pole with some metal emblem or symbol on the pole. And the whole point of an ensign or a banner, a rallying point, is for everyone to see the banner. Now, notice what Moses says. He didn't say, I'll go down into the valley or I'll go in the plains. I'll go to the top of the hill. The banner must be seen, and it was. Until Moses lowered his hands, they could no longer see the banner. What does this banner represent, and how do we connect it to Jehovah Nissi? The Lord is my banner. Well, when you read in Exodus 3 and Exodus 4, when God told Moses, Go tell my people, I remember my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm come to deliver them. I've heard their cries. Moses said in Exodus 4.1, They're not going to believe me. They won't believe that you appeared to me. God says, What's in your hand? He says, A rod. Cast it on the ground, for which he did so. It turned into a serpent. Moses was afraid. God says, Grab the serpent by the tail. He lifted it up and it returned again to a rod. From that point forward, the rod symbolized two things with Israel. Number one, the presence of God. They won't believe that you appeared to me or you are present with me. Secondly, the power of God. The rod turned into a serpent. This symbol, this banner from that day forward was always seen by Israel to represent two things. God is with us. God is for us, and God's power is also with us. Exodus chapter 7, when he appears before Pharaoh, the serpent, or the rod becomes a serpent and swallows up the two serpents of the magicians. Exodus chapter 8, the rod is used to smite the water and it turns it to blood. Exodus chapter 8, Moses uses the rod to call forth frogs out of the rivers and the streams. Exodus chapter 9, The rod is used to smite the dust that it becomes lice. Exodus chapter 9. The rod is used to call forth hail and fire and thunder and lightning from the sky. Exodus chapter 10. The rod is used to bring forth locusts to destroy the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 10. The rod is used to produce darkness all over the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 14. The rod is used to split the Red Sea. Exodus chapter 14, the rod is used to bring the waters again over the Egyptian army. And then in Exodus chapter 17, the rod is used to smite the rock to bring forth water. Now Paul tells us in the New Testament, that rock that followed them was Christ. Which means what? The rod represented the presence of Christ 
and the power of Christ. So what's the message? What does Moses see? What does he experience when he builds that altar and calls it Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, my banner? He recognizes, beloved, no matter what the odds are, no matter how powerful Amalek is, no matter how strong the world is, no matter how small we are, the banner represents God is with us and His power is for us. Did we in our own strength confide? Our strivings would be losing. We're not the right man on our side? Who is that? The Lord Sabaoth, the Lord Jesus Christ, He is on our side. The people see the rod of God, it's in their mind, they think of it, they're winning. When the rod is lowered, they can't see it, they don't see the banner, they begin to lose. So what happens? They steady the hands of Moses and the banner is over Israel and they discomfit the enemy. Which brings us to our last point, which we'll spend the rest of our time on this morning. Israel's triumph. Israel prevailed. The word means to be superior in strength. Here's the question we want to ask. How did they prevail? Only as they looked. The message of Jehovah Nisi is victory in the Lord Jesus Christ, is experienced from day to day as we look to the banner. As we look to God's presence and God's strength, we find all that we need to battle, to war against the enemy of the church and the world that we live in. Beloved, if we become friends with the world, we become an anemic church, don't we? If we become friends with the world, we become an anemic church, which means we lose our vitality, we lose our, we lose our force, we lose our power. Because if we're friends with the world, we've lost the presence of God. We've lost the power of God. We've lost the banner of God. It was only as Israel looked. Now I want you to see this in two ways. First of all, we could use this as a picture of redemption. Redemption. In Exodus 14, 13, when God redeemed them from Egyptian bondage, what did He say? Through Moses. Lift up the rod, a symbol of presence and power, and tell the people, stand still and look at the salvation of God. Don't move. Don't do any work. Don't do anything. Just stand still and behold, and you'll see the salvation of God. And then the rod part of the Red Sea. God's presence with His people. God's power with His people. God's redemption. They looked. This same word is used in the Hebrew in Numbers 21. When the people of Israel murmured against Moses again. And God sent fiery serpents to bite the people. And they started perishing. They cried out to Moses and said, Plead with the Lord. We have sinned against the Lord. And Moses did so. And then God said, make a serpent of brass and put it on a pole, an ensign, a standard, a nace, a rallying point. And it will come to pass that whoever is bitten, when they look upon the serpent, they will live. How do you live? Looking. First, it was the look of fear, wasn't it? Now, nobody was afraid until they were bitten. They had the look of fear. They knew then the, the poison is throughout my veins and I'm a dying man. Fear. Then it's the look of need. Who can help me? Who can cure me? Your mother couldn't do it. Couldn't turn to your father in that camp. You couldn't turn to Moses. You couldn't turn the, to, the, to the sword or the might of the soldier. What would somebody say? Run to the serpent and look. Just look. And instantly they were healed. That's a picture of redemption because Jesus Christ applies the serpent to himself in John 3.14. And as Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That whosoever believes, 
Now Moses records, look, Jesus says believe, because believing is seeing, and it's looking. Whosoever believes, whosoever looks at the banner, the inside, the rallying point, shall have everlasting life. Beloved, we're saved through looking, through trusting. And so the Exodus is a picture of redemption. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up, I shall draw all men to me. All men? Men is italicized. means you can take it out. I will draw all to me. All that were given to me to look upon me. All that were chosen so that they may see me. All that the Father hath given me that will look upon me in a saving way. I will lift myself up. I will be the ensign, the banner, the rallying point that whoever looks will have everlasting life. Have you looked? Have you looked out of fear because you recognize you're a sinner? Have you looked out of need and desperation for the cure of your sin? Have you found the serpent on the pole, the banner, the rallying point, Jesus Christ, to be your banner, your Savior? Redemption only takes place through looking. It is exclusive. It's the only way. But notice, secondly in our text, they were to look and then fight. So redemption comes through faith and looking, and now redemption continues, salvation continues, by looking to the same banner, the Lord Jesus Christ, and now what? Fighting. So when they could see the banner, they're prevailing. But when the banner's lowered and they look away from the banner, then Amalek prevails. Now that's a lesson for us too, isn't it, beloved? When we look by faith to Christ, we find the strength to carry on. We find the strength to persevere. We find the strength to battle, to fight the good fight of faith. When we look away from God's presence and away from God's power in the banner of the crucifixion, what happens? The world begins to prevail. The devil begins to encroach. The darkness begins to take over the light. Which brings us to a few things we want to discuss for the rest and the remainder of the time. What this means then, Israel had to be a militant nation, didn't they? Militant just means engaged in warfare, combat, fighting. Beloved, As a church, we must be militant. Would you agree with that? Now, we must be careful to understand how we're to be militant, how we are not to be. But one thing is for sure, we must look to God and fight the good fight of faith. Paul told the minister Timothy. And to fight means to be militant. We're engaged in warfare. We are fighting. We have combat to do. We are engaging in warfare. There are numerous texts throughout the Bible, particularly the New Testament for the church, that use the language of wrestling and fighting and contending and warring. God has put those in there on purpose that we may understand and be aware that we must be a militant church, not a movie theater church. A militant church that's engaged both individually and collectively in a warfare against the devil. Now who brought the fight to Israel? Amalek did. And you can be assured, the devil in the world is going to bring the fight to you. In fact, they already have. How are you doing? They will bring the fight to you. And the upshot is, we must be fighters in the right way. Now, let's look at a few passages. First, consider Matthew 16, where Jesus doesn't use the word militant, but when you look at at the wording He uses, He's surely talking about warfare. He would say to Peter and the apostles, Whom do men say that the Son of Man is? Some say you're Apollos or or, uh, Elias. Some say you're the prophet. Some say this. Some say that. Jesus says, Whom do you say that I am? Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjonas, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, because flesh and blood cannot reveal it to you, and never will. But my Father which is in heaven. That's how you know that. And friend, if you know that today, that's the only way you know it. Because God has revealed it sovereignly to you. 
And thou shalt be called Peter, and upon this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I, sovereign personal pronoun, will certainty build, advancing my personal pronoun, church, the called ecclesia. That's what you are. If you remember or read the book or seen the movie, The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, you know, there was this ugly orc. And he was frustrated because they couldn't get into Mordor. And so he says, call out Gond. I think I pronounced that right. Gond. What is that? It is a 100 foot battering ram made of black metal with a, a wolf's head in the front that has fire coming out of it. And they bring it to the gates of Mordor. Now, if you look at that battering ram, you say, there is no way Mordor has a chance. And they didn't. These mountain trolls, again, ugly beast. It was so massive, mountain trolls had to swing it. Three or four swings, gates come down. Have you ever noticed in epic battles like that, it's always the darkness that's using the battering ram against the city of light? Jesus flips. He flips it. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church because the battering ram, gone. Probably shouldn't use that. That was a ghastly looking thing. The battering ram is in the hands of the church. And it's breaking down the gates of hell. Because the devil has all of humanity captured. And under his sway. The whole world lieth in wickedness, John says. Is in the possession and in subjection to the God of this world. Now that's what John says. Jesus says the way he will build his church is through a militant church who has a battering ram who is forcing the gates of hell open and rescuing captives who are bound in chains of darkness. Notice, it's not the church that does this. Jesus says, I will build my church and he will use his church as a battering ram. Not as a retreating church. As a battering ram. In 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul would say to Timothy, But if I tarry long, that you would know how to behave yourselves in the church of God, the house of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church gets its behavior not from the government, but from God. That you would know how to behave yourself in the house of God, the church of the living God. Which is what? The pillar and ground of the truth. What does a pillar and a ground do? Maintains it, preserves it, and proclaims it. It proclaims it. When we proclaim the truth of the gospel, the devil's going to bring the fight to you. And he's going to bring it through laws. He's going to bring it through the world. He's going to bring it any way he can. If we lower the pillars, lower the banner, lower the truth, what happens? The devil's okay with that. What is the central truth that Paul would say is what the church is a pillar and ground to? We're not a ground for the truth. We're grounded upon truth and we, we hold up truth. He would say in the next verse. Great is the mystery of godliness. God manifest in the flesh. There it is. Whom do men say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. God manifest in the flesh. Beloved. We are to be disseminators of truth. And because the world doesn't like it and pushes back, and because the devil is fighting against it, is no cause for us to retreat. We look to God, we look to the banner of Jehovah Nissi, and like Israel, we fight in a different way, not with swords. Peter, put your sword in your sheath. Not with cruelty. Not being mean-spirited, but with meekness and humility, we push the battering ram against the gates of hell. With what? The message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who do we say He is? The whole church is built on that profession, isn't it? Who do you say He is? Who do you tell others that He is? He is God in the flesh. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the banner which is over us in love. Consider what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, because we need to understand what our weapons are, right? 
if we get the wrong weapons, we do the wrong kind of fighting, and then we're not under the banner in the right way. Consider 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Just a few places we'll look at. Paul says in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now, Paul apparently was a base man in his appearance. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing strong looking. And the faults of prophets uh, or the apostles that had uh, affected the church at Corinth, they rested in appearance uh, and being looking a certain way, speaking a certain way. So they thought Paul was base. I mean, who is Paul? So Paul reminds the church, though we walk in the flesh, and his flesh, his body, was not much to take account of, we do not war after the flesh. So what is Paul saying? We're in a war. What's Paul saying? He's militant. What's Paul saying? I'm ready for the task under the banner of Jehovah Nissi. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So we do have weapons, and we're to use those weapons for which Paul did as an apostle, but they're not carnal. They're not fleshly, and they're not used in our strength. They are mighty through God to the demolishing of ramparts and castles. There are some ramparts being erected in our society and all over the world, aren't there? Massive walls. How do we tear them down? Paul says this, Casting down, in verse 5, imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Paul uses spiritual weapons to cast them down. Imaginations means reasonings, thoughts, decisions, or judgments. Like the decision of Canada with the C-4 bill that was recently passed. And I'll just read the preamble. This is a high thing that's exalted itself against the knowledge of God. The preamble states this. Whereas conversion therapy causes harm to the persons who are subjected to it. Whereas conversion therapy causes harm to society because, among other things, it is based on and propagates myths and stereotypes about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. Including the myth that heterosexuality, cisgender, gender identity, and gender expression that conforms to the sex assigned to a person at birth are to be preferred over other sexual orientations. Translated, they are not to be preferred. They are not to be preferred according to this law. Now how do we fight that? What what are the weapons of our warfare? What is going to demolish This high thing that's exalted itself against God. Now one way we could use politics. Really, is that going to work? Do you think politics can cast down imaginations and bring them to the the obedience of Christ? I'm not against using methods that we can to, to change laws like that. We should want that law changed. But that's not the weapon Paul has. Politics, we really think that the Democratic and Republican and a a conservative party is really going to cast down imaginations and bring every thought to the obedience of Christ? No, we shouldn't be against those. And when those are used, wonderful. But even after, if the law in Canada is changed totally, what do we have? We still have men's hearts who have not been brought into obedience of Jesus Christ. Now be sure that the devil is after the church in this law because what it forbids is even talking about these orientations and expressions in such a way that they are wrong or sinful. That's what they're after. Now, for the record, the church does not practice conversion therapy, do we? No, we don't. Conversion therapy... In the past has been use of medical treatments, 
devices to try to change one's orientation or to repress that. We understand that we cannot repress it and we cannot change it, don't we? Is that how you were converted? Somebody came and changed what you loved. They changed what you desired. They changed your pleasure at the very root core of who you are. No, beloved, we're not involved in conversion therapy. We're involved in conversion salvation. That's what we're after. The salvation of souls. And the weapon of our warfare is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We hold up the banner of Jehovah Nissi to the world. We point them to Christ. And the Holy Spirit transforms the heart and He creates a new creature in Christ so that their thoughts now, their affections, their desires are brought captive to Christ and then they fight them. Let me be careful to say, because you're converted, all old desires don't just flee away, do they? Anybody had that experience? Everything you've ever desired that was sinful does not automatically go away, but now you have the power to fight. You have the power to wage war under the banner of Jehovah Nissi because it's His presence and His power is the only way you'll ever gain victory over those inordinate and evil desires. And then, through the same banner, we fight with the weapons of our warfare, not with instruments which cannot pull down strongholds, but with the instruments that are mighty through God to the pulling down of every high thing that exalts itself against God. Now, if it's exalting itself against the knowledge of God, what do we use? The knowledge of God. Not something else, not something, not some other instrument. We are fighting fire with fire, aren't we? We don't use a cap gun or a pea shooter. I used to have a cap gun when I was young. They're different from today. A little revolver, revolver, you open it up and there's this paper cap. You slide it in there and feed it through. And every time you pull the revolver, it, it makes the paper go forward and it hits the little bit of powder there and just a pop. The devil's tactics is not a cap gun, is it? What does he use? He uses passion. He uses pleasure. He uses desire. That's why people are so vehement against the church. It's their passions that they think we're attacking. It's their pleasures. It's what they love. So we're going to use a a cap gun, a water pistol, to fight against passion. No, we fight fire with fire. That's an idiom that means we use the same tactics. And what are the tactics of the devil? Pleasure. What are the tactics we use? Pleasure in the knowledge of God. We use passion. We use love. And we push back on the kingdom of darkness. Not with rules and regulations and principles, with the gospel. We just hold up the gospel. And what happens? God transforms people by the gospel alone because that's where His presence and that's where His power is found. And if the church is to have presence and power, we don't need an adjusted gospel. We don't need another gospel. We don't need to modify the gospel. We don't need to push some other gospel. We just need to lift up Jehovah Nissi. The banner over us is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And only when we wage warfare whether a law like that is passed, which some states have adopted these same ordinances and are adopting them, although government-wide or nationwide that has not happened like in Canada, whether they do or not, and we should seek to overturn them. Yet that's not our weapon, is it? It's not our weapon. It's not protesting. That can have a purpose. It's not writing your congressman. We should. But that doesn't bring down strongholds. It's the gospel. It's the truth of God. And so we look to the banner and we experience salvation by the power of God's sovereign grace. And we look to the same banner and now we fight. And just let me close with one more passage in Ephesians chapter 6, the one that's most well known for being a militant church, where Paul says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may stand against the wiles of the devil, the schemes, the methods of the devil. 
because we're not wrestling with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers. Now, when he says we're not wrestling with flesh and blood, he means what? We are wrestling because we're militant. We have to wrestle. We have to wrestle with principalities and powers. Now, normally in a wrestling match, you try to body slam your opponent. That won't work here. Put on the whole armor of God that you could stand against the methods of the principalities and powers. Now, what are his methods? They're myriad, but in Ephesians, his method is to splinter us and distract us, divide us, and disunify us, right? There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, Ephesians 4. Well, if he can divide us and splinter us as a church, rather than being the whole body that's fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, he wants you to go your own way. I mean, come to church, he's okay with that. Just don't start supplying anything for the body. Don't be united in one cause under the banner. Don't look to the rallying point and then join together, being attracted to the one banner, Jesus Christ, and then supplying every joint through the spiritual gifts to the edifying of the body in Christ. He wants to splinter you. Rather than being joined, he wants to disjoin you. That's a tactic. We usually don't think about that one, is it? He's disjoining Christianity now. Some of it's not true Christianity, but he's trying to disjoin because it makes us weaker. He wants to distract us from our purpose in Ephesians 3.10, which is the same larger context of wrestling. To the intent that now unto principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. The principalities that we're to make known God's wisdom to are the same principalities we wrestle against. So what's the spiritual wickedness in dark places trying to do? Move you off your purpose. From displaying the wisdom of God. And how is that wisdom displayed in Ephesians 3? To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. That the Gentiles are fellow partakers of the gospel in Christ. If he can splinter the Jews and the Gentiles in the church... Or the, or the nationalities, maybe under critical race theory or social justice or some other way and get these ethnic peoples against each other. And if he can affect the church that way, what happens? The wisdom is no longer being displayed to principalities and powers. And what is that wisdom? A unified church of the nations where white people, black people, yellow people, brown people all come under a singular banner. A singular banner. Yes, there are huge problems with critical race theory and social justice, but no, we must not divide and separate unless it is absolutely necessary. Because we're wrestling not with brothers and sisters in Christ. We're not even wrestling with the government. Wrestling against principalities and powers in heavenly places, spiritual wickedness and, and dark, uh, spiritual darkness in high places. We're wrestling against the powers that are behind Amalek and the world. We're wrestling, so Paul says, put on the armor. Do you know that there's no piece on the back of the armor? Put on the back plate of what? It's not there. Because the church is militant. There's a breastplate, there's a helmet, there's shoes, there's a sword, there's a shield. And there's something girt around the loins, but there's nothing for the back. And it's not that the church never retreats to regroup and, and pray and ask God what to do, but we're not a retreating church, we're a militant church. We're moving forward with arms, not literal swords, and not words of wars of words, using words to harm people, but with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We make war because the war we're making is being brought to us and we're in the war not to destroy because God is using us in His plan of salvation. What did God say in our context? He said, I will put out the remembrance of Amalek. I will war with Amalek from generation to generation. What does that mean? Israel has to look to God and keep warring. 
Because God is going to keep warring until finally he did put out the remembrance of Amalek. You will not meet an Amalekite. He put them out. But until the church is triumphant and the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of our God, and they will, we fight. We fight on. We, we press on with the gospel, with the spirit of meekness and humility, with all the weapons of our warfare that God has given us under the banner, Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. Let's pray. Father, we thank you.